Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to InfoGamer. It is now 2019, which is super exciting. I want to wish everyone a happy new year and I hope you had a good holiday season. We have some big plans for the new year and we expect 2019 to be filled with awesome projects and a whole lot more tutorials. And so I'm back from my vacation and I'm ready to get back to work. So let's kick off the new year with some new Photon tutorials. In this lesson, we're going to talk about animations in multiplayer games. So let's get started. Now before we begin, make sure that you subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you can get updates when we publish new videos. First off, I want to mention that all the animations that we'll be using and looking at in this video will be managed using the animator component found in Unity. We won't be using the older animation component for this tutorial. Now there's two types of animations that can be found in a multiplayer game. There's animations that need to be synchronized across the network, and there's animations that don't need to be synchronized across the network. We're first going to talk about the animations that don't need to be synchronized across the network, and the reason why they don't need to be synchronized is because the timing of these animations do not affect the players or the gameplay of your game. An example of a non-synchronized animation can be found in my snake cube game. In my snake cube game, there is a skin for the snake where the segments of the snake are eyeballs, and the eyeballs actually move with an animation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a multiplayer game. Here I have my phone, and I'm going to play it on my editor, and we're going to connect up, and I'll show you that we have the animation playing on both devices. All right, so here you can see we have the two snakes with the eyeball skin applied to them. Now it's a little hard to see in the editor because the lighting is so dark when you load into a new scene. And so I've recorded my phone so that you can see it with its proper lighting. Now if you look closely, each individual eyeball has its own animation playing. And these animations are not being synchronized across the network. There is no message being sent from one client to another to tell that client which animation it should play. But what's happening here instead is that each client is playing the animation for each eyeball on its own. And it just so happens that those animations are somewhat synchronized because each object is being instantiated at the same time. And each animation starts in the same place, and that's why it might look like these animations are synchronized. However, there is no message being sent from one client to another telling that client which animation to play. Another example of this is the coin object in the scene. The coin object isn't being animated, instead it has a script attached to it that is randomly rotating that coin in any direction. But that code is being executed on its own for each of the clients, and so the rotation of the coin on my phone isn't going to perfectly match the rotation of the coin in the editor. But when all boils down, these objects don't need to have the same animations playing at the same time on every single client. Because I might see one thing, but I'm not going to know what the other people are seeing. Now you might be wondering, is there anything special about animations that aren't synchronized across the network? And the answer is no, there's nothing really special about these animations. These animations are essentially the same as if you were animating an object for a single player game. It just so happens that those animations are playing on multiple clients, but there's no message being sent from one client telling another client that it needs to play this animation at this time. So all the clients are responsible for playing those animations on their own. Now let's talk about animations that you do want to synchronize. We'll talk about when you want to synchronize animations, and we'll also show you how to synchronize animations. Now you want to synchronize animations where the timing of the animation is critical to the gameplay of your game. So any animations that are applied to player objects are important to synchronize, and also animations within your scene and animations that are applied to NPC objects that are critical to the gameplay of your game. Are important to synchronize. Let's say maybe it's an enemy NPC like a boss for an RPG raid. In this scenario it would be very important to synchronize all of the attack animations so that all of the players can see which attack he's about to do 
and then they can counter that attack. A lot of times you can look at a scenario and determine whether or not the animations need to be synchronized or not. And there's two questions that I would ask myself. The first one is, does it matter that the players see the same thing at the same time? If it doesn't, then they don't need to be synchronized. And the second is, is the timing of the animation critical to the progression of the game and its gameplay? If it is, then this animation should be synchronized. So now that we've talked about these two different types of animations, let's show you how to synchronize an animation. So here we have our Photon project open inside of Unity, and the first thing that I'm going to need is a character that has animations. And there we go, we have our chef Giuseppe from our Mario Run tutorial. If you remember him, he has animations, and so we're going to be using this character to animate and synchronize his animations across the network. So with our character, we have his animator controller, which is right here, and I'm going to drag it into our animator component. Now, if we don't have multiple character models or skins for our players to choose from, then this game object could be our player's avatar the actual object that we're moving around the scene. In that case, you would want to make sure that this character has a photon view. And so I'm going to go ahead and add that. The next thing that we're going to need is the photon animator view. And so let's go ahead and add that. Once I attach the animator view, you can see that we have a number of different options. And these options actually match the layers and parameters of my animator controller. And so here in the animator window, you can see that we have the same parameters and the same layers as what it shows in the inspector. And so if your animator controller is set up differently than mine, which chances are it is, then you're going to have different options within your animator view. They are going to coincide with the same parameters that you will have in your animator controller. Now I'm actually going to simplify my animator controller just so that it's easier to demonstrate in this tutorial. And so all I did was I created one new parameter called is walking, and then I selected the transition from idle to walk, and I set the condition to is walking equals true, and then the transition from walking to idle, I set the condition of is walking equals false. Now the next thing I'm going to do is in the inspector, I'm going to set the layer zero of my photon animator view to discrete, and then I'm going to set is walking to discrete as well. Now there are three options. There's disabled, which means that parameter will not be synchronized across the network. There's discrete, which I believe means every once in a while or whenever there's a change in a parameter, that's when it is then synchronized across the network. And then there's continuous, which is pretty self-explanatory. Every set interval of time, it will send a message to synchronize the animations. And so I actually really like the photon animator view, and I like that it uses the animator component rather than the animation component. Because in my opinion, the animator component can do so much more than just the animation component. I also like how this does a lot of the work for you. So rather than having to send an RPC function to all of the other clients telling them to change a certain value in the animator or telling them to play a specific animation, this will synchronize those values for you and then the animator components of those clients will handle the rest. Now the next thing that we need to do similar to the photon transform view we need to select our photon animator view and drag it into the observed component of our photon view. Now if we were making this object into our player avatar object then we would need to make sure that this object has all of the other components and scripts that are found on our player avatar object. So such as our player movement script, our avatar setup script, and so on. But in our game, we had all of those different characters that our players could choose from. And all of those different character models would have their own animators and animations. And so we need to make sure that this character object is separate from our player avatar. However, this causes a little bit of a problem because in order to synchronize the animations of our character across the network, that means we need to have a photon view attached to this object. And that then means that we need to instantiate this object across the network instead of 
individually on each client. And so in order to do this, we need to make some changes to our avatar setup script. And we're also going to be making changes to our player movement script so that we can trigger the animations. So I'm going to first open our avatar setup script. Once you have this script open inside Visual Studios, the first thing that we're going to do is create a new variable up at the top. And this is going to be a public animator variable. And we're going to just call it animator. The next thing that we need to do is find where we are instantiating our character model, which is right here in our RPC add character function. And so rather than instantiating this object locally, we now need to instantiate it across the network. And that will look something like this. So we call photon network .instantiate. We then need to have path .combined, and path isn't recognized. So I'm going to click Alt Enter, and then I'm going to include using system.io. We're then looking in our photon prefabs folder, which is in our resource folder. And then we need to get the name of our character model. To get that name, I'm going to go back to Unity and I'm going to select our Chef Giuseppe in the hierarchy. And I need to make a prefab out of this object. So I'm going to drag it into our resource photon prefabs folder. I'm then going to select the name of our new prefab. I'm going to copy it, go back to Visual Studios, and I'm going to paste it in here. Now, if I wanted to have the same character select option that we had previously, all I would have to do is rather than having an array of all the different character prefabs, I would have an array of all the names of the character prefabs. And then I would use that array to select its string and put it here. Now, the next thing that I need to do is make sure that this character object is a child to our player avatar. Now, the normal instantiate function allows us to specify the transform of the parent object, but this function does not. And so I'm just going to use the my character variable dot transform dot parent. I'm going to set it equal to the transform of this object, which is our player avatar. Now, the last thing that we need to do inside this function is set our new animator variable. And so I'm going to type animator equals my character dot get component animator parentheses, semicolon. Now, because we're instantiating this object across the network, we no longer need to call this function as an RPC. If we did, we would then end up with duplicate objects. And so I'm going to remove the pun RPC tag, and I'm going to remove RPC out in front of this function. Now, the last thing that we need to do is change how we're calling this function. And so here you can see we have our old RPC command. I'm going to replace that with just add character. And for the parameter, I'm going to pass in a zero. So that'll instantiate our new character and it'll set our animator variable, which we'll need for triggering its animations. Now let's save this script and go over to our player movement script. The first thing that we're going to do within our player movement script is create a new variable. This is going to be a private variable and it's going to be of type avatar setup. And I'm just going to call it avatar setup with a lowercase a. We then want to set this variable and I'm going to do that in the start function. So I'll say avatar setup equals get component. And I'm going to pass in avatar setup. Now we can access some of the variables within our avatar setup script. And one of those variables is the animator component. And so I'm going to scroll down to our basic movement function. And here in the first if statement, where we're checking to see if the player is holding W, I'm going to actually comment out where we're moving our player controller. And this is just because it will be easier to see the animations playing if our character isn't moving. And so now I'm going to trigger our walk animation. And so I'm going to get our avatar setup variable. And then inside that, I'm going to get our animator variable. And then I'm going to call the set bool function. Now we need to pass in the string name of the parameter that we want to set, which is is walking. And then the value that we want to pass in is true. So that will trigger our walk animation. Now we want to stop our walk animation. And so I'm going to copy this if statement and I'm going to paste it right below it but I'm going to add an else if right here. 
and we're going to then check to see if we're not holding down the W key. If we're not holding down the W key, then I want to set this to false. And I believe that's everything that we need. So let's go ahead and save this script and go back to Unity. Once we're back in Unity, there's one more thing that I'm going to do to my character object, and that is I'm going to add a photon transform view. I'm then going to click this plus sign next to our observed components. I'm going to drag in our transform view to that second field. Now the reason why I'm doing this is because we're instantiating our character object across the network. However, we are not synchronizing the parent of that character across the network. And so if we don't synchronize the transform of this character object, then the character itself won't move for the other players. Now I did try sending an RPC that would synchronize the parent of this character, which is the avatar, across the network, but then I found a problem where the character's movement was very jittery. This is a behavior that I haven't quite figured out, but I believe it's something that we could fix if we were to create our own custom animator view, which is something that we'll do in the near future. So for now, what we need to do is we need to hit apply on our character model that will apply all of these changes to our prefab in our resource folder. I'm then going to delete our chef Giuseppe prefab from our hierarchy and as well our player avatar prefab from the hierarchy. I'm also going to hide my team picker menu system that way I just don't have to deal with it at the moment. Let's go ahead and save this scene and go back to our main menu scene. And from here I'm going to build our project. Once it's built I'm going to hit play in the standalone and play in the editor. In the standalone, I'm going to create a new room by giving it a name and a room size. I'm then going to click Create. In the editor, I'm going to click Find Room. I'm going to select the room. And then in the standalone, I'm going to click Start Game. And here you can see we have our two Chef Giuseppes. One is our local player, which is from a first person view. You can kind of see his glove over on the left hand side. And then our other player out in front of us. And so I'm going to switch over to our editor. I'm going to rotate our character around so I can see our standalone character. And then I'm going to switch back. And there you can see our editor character is now looking straight at our standalone character. If I were to move this over so that you can see both screens, we have both characters looking at each other. Now if I were to press W, which is to trigger our animation, you can see that our standalone character is walking in our standalone, you can see his gloves and his feet. And then in our editor, you can see that our standalone character is walking as well. Now the movement is still a little jittery, but I believe that's just due to the player's movement speed because the movement speed is still really fast. And so our local player moves really fast and then the remote version of that character is just lagging a little bit behind. And so it causes a little bit of a jitter, but it's not as bad as it was when I had the character object, a child, to the avatar object across all the clients. And there you can see the walking again. I'll get right up in front. Pretty cool. And so that's everything that we're going to talk about in this lesson on animations in multiplayer games. As I said, in the near future, we'll probably do a video on creating a custom animator view. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. Make sure that you like this video. And if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them in the comments below. Also subscribe to our channel so you can be up to date on all our latest videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.